We're looking at this week's health headlines and back in studio is our medical contributor and Northwestern medicine physician, Dr. Lauren Stryker. Welcome Good morning. back. I'm so happy to be back in studio. Great in to person. see you this again. So what are we going to start with? Zinc? Zinc, because zinc, of course, is the cure-all for everybody. You know, you name it, and someone is taking zinc to see mm -hmm. if it's going to help. So the studies have not been very good, but a very good study did just get released of over 5,000 men and women to see specifically, does zinc help cure a cold? and does it prevent a cold? So let's start with curing the cold, because that was actually better news. What they found in this study is that people that had a cold and took zinc had a huge reduction in severe symptoms, and some people almost 80 to 90% reduction in symptoms, and the cold did go away faster, almost two days less sick than the people who didn't take zinc. But then on the flip side, they looked at people that took zinc to prevent a cold. So what they did was they gave half the people zinc, half the people no zinc, and they infected everyone. Great study. Let's give everyone a cold and see what happens. And in fact, there was no difference. So bottom line, the takeaway from this is don't take zinc on a regular basis to prevent a cold, but it may be worthwhile to take it to help with those symptoms and make it go away quicker. And last caveat, don't use it in your nose, the nasal spray, mm -hmm. because there are reports of people who lose their taste of smell forever. Oh. This oh is my not gosh. a temporary thing. Forever. Are so, they selling that over the counter? Yeah. yeah. Oh. So the way to do it is, is um, under the tongue. You want to use either drops or a lozenge melted under the tongue. 50 to 75 milligrams in this study was the magic dose that seemed to make the most difference. Okay. But, you know, we're, we're entering cold yeah. season. All right. That could help. All right. Can you get infections from public bathrooms? <laughs> Another hot topic. And there are three areas of concern. One is the surfaces, you know, toilet seats, surfaces, all of that. The second is aerosol from the toilet flushing. And the third is how best to dry your hands. So there's been a lot of studies, again, not great studies, but a big study just came out looking at 65 older studies to really parse this out. So let's start with the old surface thing. No, you really don't need to worry about getting COVID or other nasty bugs from surfaces because viruses are pretty fragile and they don't last very long. So if you do touch surfaces, obviously mm. wash your hands, but that's not something you need to worry about. The toilet flushing, what would you guess on that one? It's, uh, it sounds pretty I don't nasty. really wanna know. You yeah. don't wanna know. <laughs> Actually, it's okay. They ah. found that the aerosol from toilets does not really seem to spread the germs. They land on, you know. Yeah surfaces and it's okay. But then the hand washing, are you a towel or a... I like dry. a towel. If there's a towel, I'm taking a paper towel. Yeah. You're taking a paper I towel. I like to mix it up. You like to mix it up. <laughs> Mixing it up may be the best way to go. Oh, well. Because it turns out that the, the electric dryer is not going to disperse those germs, but people tend not to get their hands dry enough. They do the, the way right. the, the way yeah. they run, and it turns out that wet hands is really how you can transfer those mm. viruses and bacteria. So the towel costs more and it's not as environmentally friendly but people tend to dry their hands better and then grab the door ah. bottom line is it's the most dangerous thing in a bathroom is the other people in the bathroom mm. you know make sure this is not the place to take off your mask this isn't the place to have conversations yeah. with strangers but the rest of the stuff wash your hands you don't need to worry so much all right what about broken heart syndrome broken What's that? heart syndrome has been a phenomenon which has been described in the medical literature for years and basically this is a heart condition that mimics having a heart Heart attack. People that have broken heart syndrome have shortness of breath. They can have chest pain, but it's not triggered by clogged arteries. It's triggered by stress, particularly things like um, someone has died in your life or you're in a very stressful situation. And it's, this isn't psychological, this is real. It turns out that the stress hormones make the heart beat not as efficiently so that the ventricle gets enlarged and people get these symptoms, which in fact can be as dangerous as a heart attack. But the good news is, is that if it's recognized and diagnosed, then it's not forever. You know, this is a temporary thing. Why am I talking about it today? Well, a study just came out showing that there's been a 90% increase in people having this condition, particularly in women, specifically women over the age of 50. And that begs the question of why? Why are we seeing so much of this? You know, one, of course, I think is more recognition. But the other is we've had a lot of stress this year. You know, people have lost a lot of people to COVID, stressful, you know, work. I mean, we, we all know the drill, you yeah, know, yeah. the stress. So, but the important thing is, is people need to be aware of this. You know, you don't ignore ever chest pain, shortness of breath if you're feeling faint, but this is on the list of things that may be causing it that's not what you think. 
Wow, always good to talk to you, Dr. Stryker. Thanks for coming in. Thank you. If you have a question for the doctor, you can go to uh, drstryker.com, and there you can follow her on social media. Have a great Thanksgiving. Happy you Thanksgiving. Too. Uh, time out for around town. Hey, Anna.